today. Thank you for inviting me, Rob. Um, so I'm going to be talking about AV fistulas and traumatic AV fistulas and pseudoaneurysms and when to intervene, um, my disclosures. So most of us are well familiar with the, with the arterial find with the angiographic findings with uh, arterial trauma. Typically we're looking for extravasation, but there's many more subtle uh, angiographic findings such as an intimal flap or dissection, uh, vasospasm, intramural hematoma, et cetera. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on today is mainly pseudoaneurysms and AV fistula. And I know somebody else in one of the other talks already discussed, defined what, AV fist, what pseudoaneurysms are uh, versus true aneurysms. So putting this talk together was a little bit challenging for me because there really isn't much data. Um, there's uh, uh, all, what's out there is basically case reports and small case series, certainly no randomized prospective trials. The only real data that we have, or mo much of the data comes out of the military. Um, and, and specifically, um, where the recent data is coming out of from the Afghanistan and Iraq uh, conflicts. So this was uh, uh, a nice article out of uh, Walter Reed. And they were in a unique situation where they had uh, um, soldiers out in the field and they were injured with IEDs, RPGs, high velocity weapons or mortars. They were treated for their obvious injuries in the field and then they were evacuated to Washington, D.C. Um, and they saw 124 patients, and of those 124, they found they had a series of 13 pseudoaneurysms of the, of the head and neck. Um, five of these patients were initially symptomatic, uh, and the other eight were asymptomatic, and based on the existing literature with pseudoaneurysms, uh, uh, iatrogenic pseudoaneurysms in the femoral artery, they initially elected to follow those. Unfortunately, two of them um, had sudden bleeding events. Um, one had uh, sudden onset of neck swelling, another had massive bleed into the airway. And following these experiences, um, they changed their treatment protocol and really were decided to, they ought to be treating all pseudoaneurysms. Um, here's a case I had from a number of years ago, a uh, 20-year-old uh, man who said he fell off his BMX bike and one of those pegs on the back penetrated his medial thigh. And initially, they were treating it conservatively. And the following morning, when they went to change his dressing, he had pulsatile arterial bleeding coming out of the site. So initial angiogram, not seeing a lot here, um, negative. So what I do in these uh, situations, um, I put a uh, radiopaque metallic marker, a BB, right on the site, get the catheter a little bit more selective, um, and then we were able to see that, in fact, there is a small pseudoaneurysm there. And it looks pretty subtle, but once you do a super selective uh, catheterization of that small muscular branch, you see it's actually uh, more uh, impressive. Um, and the key with these is to get out distally beyond it, embolize distal and proximal. Um, the uh, so-called sandwich technique, um, if you can't get out distal to it, I ought to consider using a liquid embolic such as glue. Um, and the final result was, was very nice. So switching gears to uh, traumatic AV fistulas, the vast majority of, of traumatic AV fistulas are, are due to penetrating trauma. The ones that are due to blunt trauma usually involve fractures, either skull-based fractures with, uh, with uh, cavernous carotid fistulas or, or long bone fractures. And of course, we have iatrogenic uh, um, uh, AV fistulas. Um, they're frequently asymptomatic, and it really requires, oftentimes may require a meticulous physical exam to detect them. Um, there may be no hematoma, no swelling. The patient may describe a pathognomonic machinery murmur, but oftentimes not and you have to have a high clinical index of suspicion and, and auscultate the area. There's also something called the Nicola Doni Israel Branham sign, which is basically when you compress the fistula or the feeding artery, you have an increase in peripheral vascular resistance, uh, which gives you an increase in afterload and a reflex bradycardia. So that's something to think about. Um, most common locations in traumatic AV fistulas. Uh, in the military population, it was mostly fe femoral and popliteal. Uh, in the civilian population, more abdominal, uh, aortocaval, iliac. Um, and when they are missed, in, in, in the missed AV fistulas, you, you have to worry about high output CHF and cardiomegaly. Um, they will frequently get aneurysmal degeneration, not only of the feeding artery, but of the vein itself with venous hypertension, pain, and limb overgrowth. Uh, so treatment, obviously, you want to shut down the communication between the artery and the vein. They typically do not spontaneously resolve. On the contrary, they can enlarge and become much more impressive and more difficult to treat down the road. And you want to shut it down either with either embolizing it if it's uh, small peripheral branches or potentially covered stents. Um, when you do have a missed AV fistula where you have these big venous aneurysms, it's sort of counterintuitive, but after shutting down the AV, fist AV communication, you may want to anticoagulate the patient because that big patulous venous segment is at risk of thrombosing. Uh, 
Um, so here's another uh, pretty large, impressively large series um, out of South Africa where they had, uh, they accumulated 202 patients with traumatic AV fistulas. I think they had a lot of border conflicts at the time in the, in the 90s and a lot of uh, military weapons and AK-47s in the civilian population. Um, so um, only four of their cases were related to blunt trauma, almost all from uh, penetrating trauma. Interestingly, they missed 69 patients, 69 of the, 20, of the 202 patients were missed and presented between one week and 12 years following their injury. And the more time that evolved between the injury and the repair, the greater the incidence of complications and death. And that was particularly relevant with cervical and mediastinal injuries. Also interesting in this study, they only saw CHF in three patients. And all three of those patients had an underlying cardiomyopathy. So it may be that the risk of CHF from these AV fistula has been overstated. Um, here's an example that I have from a number of years ago. This was a 20-year-old male who was stabbed in the axilla. Um, and he has all the findings here. He has a pseudoaneurysm in his axillary artery, he has an AV fistula, and he has clot or DVT in the axillary vein as well. And this is an older case. Um, I did an oblique to show that it's extra thoracic. I think all we had available at that time was wall grafts, and we were not very eager to put a wall graft in the axilla of a 20-year-old guy. The surgeon felt he could get proximal and distal control, so he had this uh, surgically repaired and actually had a pretty difficult post-operative course. Um, so why am I showing you all these old cases? Um, this is uh, historical data from the NYPD showing what has happened in New York City uh, with uh, crime. These specifically, the, these are the seven index crimes that the NYPD follows. And you can see murder down 85% since 1990, you know, robbery down 85%, felony assault down 50%. So unless you work at a major level one trauma center, you're really not seeing a lot of, a lot of this stuff anymore. Um, what so I'm more likely to see in my practice is iatrogenic injuries. Um, this is a patient who, uh, who with hepatitis C had a liver biopsy for staging. And we did an ultrasound guided liver biopsy. You can faintly see the needle here in uh, segment two, three. And the patient presents one week later with melana and maroon stools. Um, so here's the angiogram. And what you can see on the selective left hepatic injection, segment two, three, you have a pseudoaneurysm there. And in addition to that, there's an early draining vein or AV fistula. So in this case, um, we were unable to get out beyond the pseudoaneurysm and do the so-called sandwich technique. Um, could have used glue. The operator chose to use uh, large particles to go out, flow out distally to prevent back bleeding and then coil proximally. And, and, and that patient did very well. Um, finally, probably the most common pseudoaneurysm that most of us would see in our practice. Uh, this is a very subtle example of a uh, of a femoral artery pseudoaneurysm, post-femoral artery catheterization, has the characteristic to and fro flow, a nice long neck leading up to the native artery. Um, indications to treat this would be if the patient has a symptomatic hematoma or an expanding hematoma, or if, it, or if the pseudoaneurysm is enlarging, um, uh, or if the patient needs to remain on anticoagulation or antiplatelet medication for other reasons. The way most of us are treating these um, these days um, is with uh, thrombin injection, percutaneous thrombin injection. Um, things to watch out for when you do a thrombin injection, you want to make sure there's no coexisting AV fistula. That would be an absolute contraindication. Uh, things that would clue you off or tip you off would be forward diastolic flow in the pseudoaneurysm. Um, also, if you have low resistance in the pseudoaneurysm with high velocity flow across the arterial connection, you should also suspect that and maybe consider doing an angiogram. Um, a short or wide neck, you should proceed with caution, but that's not an absolute contra contraindication. Um, and here is that same pseudoaneurysm under grayscale imaging, uh, uh, putting a 21 gauge needle in there, and then after injecting it with, uh, and watching it real time with color imaging and, and seeing it thrombose while confirming patency of the native artery. Um, and uh, uh, here's a couple of studies looking at femoral pseudoaneurysms and when they should be treated. The first two studies here look at about 154 patients. All their pseudoaneurysms were under, uh, under 3, 3.5 centimeters, and you see they all did very well. The vast majority of them thrombosed. It should be noted none of these patients were on anticoagulation or antiplatelet medication. The studies by Kent and Stone basically confirmed what the first two studies showed uh, in patients who were not on anticoagulation or antiplatelet medication. However, if patients were anticoagulated or, antiplate or on antiplatelet medication, um, they had a much higher likelihood of not spontaneously thrombosing. So in, in conclusion, traumatic, non-iatrogenic pseudoaneurysms and AV fistulas, they should pretty much always be treated.
Um, iatrogenic femoral artery pseudoaneurysms I look at as a different category. Um, if they're associated with a large or expanding hematoma, uh, if the patient's symptomatic, if it's larger than two, maybe three centimeters, um, and if the patient needs to continue anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy, those should uh, probably be treated as well. Thank you.